Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Kincaid, and I'm the general manager of Second Quadrant uh, here in the United States, and I'm joined by Andrew Dunstan, who's a longtime Postgres developer and committer. Uh, and we're going to talk to you today about freezing and wrap around through pictures. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our talk. All right, before we begin, we want to introduce our company just a little bit, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into today's technical topic. Uh, so it was founded by an enterprise architect many years ago, about 14, 15 years ago. He was told to find an alternative database for uh, the predominantly used database at the time. I won't mention the specific database. Uh, but on the way out, he was told the answer should be another very well-known commercial database. But he took a very large look around, and he found Postgres. And he loved Postgres. And he said, well, you know, if there were just a few additional features, this would be an enterprise-ready database uh, capable of being deployed in many of my commercial customers. And so he actually implemented some of those things. And those things included backup and recovery, point-in-time recovery, streaming replication. And over time, he formed a company that did two things. One is to advance Postgres. And the second thing is to support Postgres and offer services around it. And that company is Second Quadrant. And we're here representing Second Quadrant. And we do Postgres technical support for many Fortune 100, even Fortune 10 companies, and very many large startups. And we do remote DBA training, consulting, and services. Uh, not only have we, read, have we wrote a large portion of the Postgres database, the source code, we've also written many books about Postgres. So that's who we are. Um, so Andrew, I've introduced myself a little bit. Would you like to introduce yourself a little bit further? Uh, hi, yes, I'm Andrew Dunstan. I'm a, a consultant with uh, with Second Quadrant, uh, and uh, I'm also a Postgres committer. Okay, so um, why this talk? Why did we pick this topic? Well, I've had lots of chats and talks with people about freezing and wraparound, and a lot of customers who are confused about it, and sometimes they're in pain. And it's one of those things you don't really, many people really don't take time to understand it until they've experienced a problem. And it's one of those things if you understand early and you plan for some potential issues and do some proper monitoring, you won't experience some of the pain we're talking about. And one thing I've found over the years is there's lots of great documentation for Postgres, lots of great email lists, lots of great blogs, but there's not a lot of pictures. and. I like being part of a Postgres community, and since I'm not a great blogger or coder, what I like to do is draw pictures, and I'll talk to people like Andrew about the way things work. I'll talk to customers about their current understanding, and then I'll work with uh, somebody like Andrew and many others, Alvaro Herrera, Simon, to draw pictures about what's actually taking place and to communicate that. And this is our second talk. The first talk we did was vacuum through pictures, which we actually gave at this conference last year and have done a number of webinars on since. And we, I personally believe that Postgres really needs more pictures for its users. Okay, so um, kind of furthering this concept, I recently came across a blog, and many of you did probably too. It's called 10 Things I Hate About Postgres. And number one item on this blog is uh, transaction ID wraparound. And it was written, um, the blog was written into response to all the love Postgres was getting. So it wasn't a, a hit piece on Postgres. But it was basically saying these are the things, you know, that concern me. Um, and despite everything, the bloggers still love Postgres. And so that's one element of led into me developing this talk along with Andrew or Andrew and I developing this talk. And just to kind of put this where it is in the picture series that we're kind of working on, maybe we'll do one of these a year. We did vacuum through pictures last year. Um, we're doing freezing through pictures this year. And then uh, future things will be things about hot updates and fill factor through pictures, another concept people struggle with at the time. And the other, finally, uh, we'll do monitoring for vacuum, freezing, and analyzing. Again, future, uh, future talks, but this is kind of where we're at in this series of talks. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit about why Postgres does freezing. This is our agenda, by the way, and um, what it does, the actual operation of freezing. And... Um, and we're going to talk about the relationship between freezing and vacuuming. These things are often confused and intermixed. Uh, we'll talk about um, the relationship they have. There is some relationship. They're not completely independent, but they are unique operations. And then we're going to talk about your options for tuning back for freezing. I'm sorry. And then we'll talk about some of the best practices associated with um, planning 
database deployments and application development relative to this, uh, this issue we're discussing today. Okay, so this is how, this is sort of the same thing I've given when I've talked about vacuum. What are the things you should do? First thing you should do, if you're doing a Postgres deployment of any size, and particularly you have a lot of update and certain delete transactions, uh, transactions that do right, you want to understand what freezing is and why it's necessary. All right, what is tuple freezing? What is it? And, and then based on that, if you can, make proper application design choices. And then, um, you want to monitor for things around uh, freezing. There's various tools you can use. There's queries you can run, and then you want to tune. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people start in the other direction. They start by tuning for freezing, uh, and then they start getting into looking into monitoring and what's happened. And finally, they understand what they're actually going after. So this is the um, this is the formula again. Understand, make proper design choices, monitor, and tune based on your monitoring. So now we want to get into a little bit greater detail about how this is implemented. Um, there are two additional fields uh, that are not visible to all selects in each row. So two additional four byte fields, all right, 32 bit values. And so I've done a select um, star from PG Bench history. And you'll see that I just get the standard schema, the, uh, uh, the teller ID, the branch ID, the account ID, the delta, and the time it occurred. Now, if I do the same thing again, but this time I add select xmin comma xmax star from PG Bench history, you'll notice I get two additional columns that were not part of my select star statement. And the two columns I get are the xmin ID. It's the transaction, and that xmin ID is the ID of the transaction that created the tuple. Uh, the xmax is the transaction ID that deleted or updated the tuple. Again, remembering an update is effectively uh, a delete and insert. So this is actually a live tuple and that it's xmax is not, is not, uh, doesn't have a value. Or it's xmax is zero, I should say. All right, so to kind of look at this a little bit, um, the current transaction compares the transaction ID to the xmin value of the row. And based on that, it's able to determine if the transaction is going to be visible to the current transaction. And so the question now becomes, OK, this is a 32-bit value. And I keep, um, I keep iterating, I keep incrementing it with each transaction. So I do transaction one, I do transaction two, I do transaction three. So what happens when I get to 2 to the 32, which is um, effectively um, uh, turns out, well, what actually happens is it goes around to zero because, of course, a database is capable of handling more than uh, 4 billion transactions, all right? So I get to uh, 2 to the 32 or roughly uh, somewhere around 4 billion plus, and then I go back to zero. Okay, now we're going to be adding videos to this particular, um, this particular presentation. So not only do we have uh, pictures and content and diagrams, we actually have some small movies. So this movie will be added in later uh, during this presentation. So I, we're going to cut to the movie. So cutting to the movie, three, two, one. Well, my name is Tom Kincaid, and I'm going to explain Postgres Transaction ID Wraparound. Imagine a circle of points. Right at the top of the circle, we have point zero. Right next to point zero, we have transaction ID 2 to the 32 minus 1, or point 2 to the 32 minus 1. As the application executes update, delete, and insert transactions against the database, the current transaction ID advances by the numbers represented by the points on this circle. When we get to transaction ID 2 to the 32 minus 1, and it commits, the next current transaction ID will be 0. In other words, the transaction ID has wrapped around. Okay, we're back from the movie and we're continuing on with our presentation. Now, we have something called the transaction visibility space, where only um, each trans, you have the current transaction ID, and then you need to, um, there's a certain number of transactions that are in the transaction's future, and a certain number of transactions that are in the transaction's past. So, if my transaction, ID, and it's roughly half of two to the thirty-two or two to the thirty-one that are on each side of the of that of that line. So two to thirty-one transactions are in the future, 
and two to the 31 transactions are in the past. So if I take my current transaction ID and I say it's, um, let's call it 200 million, all right? Um, all the transaction IDs from 200 million over to 200 million plus two to the 31 are part of my future, where all the transaction IDs on this side of the line, 200 million minus one, I won't call it the exact number, down around here, crossing over zero, are on the, in my transaction IDs past. Okay, and it's what it really means is rows with X-Men values on this side of the line, the X-Men values on this side of the line, values on this side of the line may not be visible to the current transaction. Um, they, meaning they're in the future. All right, and whereas this side of the line, uh, this side of the line or in the past are in are also visible. Okay, so at this point, we're going to do our second video. So cutting to our second movie, um, three, two, one, movie. Hello, back with another video. I dressed up a little bit because this concept is a little more complicated than the last one. Okay, let's start by bringing up our circle of points again. Right at the top, we have zero. Right at the bottom, we have two to the 31. All right, let's pick a random point along the circle. 200 million. So I'm gonna draw a line from 200 million to the other side of the circle, which is gonna be 200 million plus two to the 31, roughly 2.1 billion. So this represents 2.1 billion transactions on this side of the line and 2.1 billion transactions on this side of the line. Actually, the number is not quite 2.1 billion, but for the sake of this demonstration, we're going to call it 2.1 billion. Transactions on this side of the line are in the current transaction's future. I didn't mention it, but 200 million, that's our current transaction ID. So transactions on this side of the line are transaction IDs in the current transaction's future. This side of the line are transactions of the current transaction IDs past. Visible to the current transaction, probably not visible to the current transaction here. Whether it is visible or not depends on your transaction isolation level. See you at the next video. Okay, we're back from our movie and we're continuing on. Now, what freezing does is it actually visits the row, and if there are no transactions, if there are no transactions visible, um, let me let me extend this slide for a minute. If there are no transactions that need the current row or have visibility into the current row, and a freeze operation is taking place, it will mark this the row as being in the past to all transactions. Okay, so even though it has an X min value that's uh, in the future of the current transaction ID, the row has been frozen. So freezing means this row is now in the past to all transactions. So it's part of, it's now visible to all transactions because it's in the past. It's not part of the future. Yeah, that's right, Tom, because you don't want to be uh, moving forward and all of a sudden have transactions that were at one time part of your past become uh, part of your future. Uh, so we're going to be talking about what happens uh, in that case and how to avoid it. So this is a um, this is a really good slide that Andrew had me um, had me add. So maybe the slide doesn't have any pictures, but probably the uh, the key to understanding slide vacuum is about cleaning up dead tuples. Okay, so tuples that are uh, the space is being is no longer uh, no longer being used. Uh, so we can reuse that space for future tuples or um, whatever whatever it is. So the database doesn't grow indefinitely, and we don't have pages with lots of holes in it. And again. Please see our previous uh, presentation on this, Vacuum Through Pictures. And I'll have some other articles you can reference as well. Uh, freezing is ensuring that old live tuples remain visible. All right, so they're old, uh, they're live, no transaction needs them. Make sure that they're visible to all transactions. Okay, so which rows can be frozen? So only rows with an X been older than the oldest currently live transaction. And this really doesn't have any MVC implications, okay? So the but here's one thing to report in your first design principle and those concept. If you have a transaction that runs for an extended period of time, so I click on, I bring up a GUI, I click on, uh, you know, start my day, I do a begin, and then uh, my transaction, uh, my transactions continue to execute, 
and I leave that transaction open until I come back and do a okay, hit the OK button and commit. I've delayed the freezing operation, and I've probably created a lot of bloat in the database if there's a lot of other activity happening in the database at this time. So again, long-running transactions can delay freezing and increase bloating. And there are various queries uh, to find out if you have long-running transactions. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, what would happen if we didn't have freezing. So we've been uh, taking this uh, case where our current transaction ID is 200 million and if, our, if that's our current transaction ID then the event horizon which is uh, in effect the boundary between the past and the future is going to be 2 to the 31 plus 200 million. So then we're going to uh, imagine what happens if we do another 200 million uh, transactions, updates, deletes, inserts. And so then the current transaction ID will move to 400 million and the event horizon is also going to move because it's always uh, 2 to the 31 ahead of or behind the uh, current transaction. And so it's moved ahead to this, uh, um, this number 2 to the 31 plus 400 million. So the question is what happens to the tuples that the event horizon crossed over? In this area, it moved from uh, uh, from 2 to the 31 plus 200 million to 2 to the 31 plus 400 million. And suddenly, without freezing, any tuples with uh, transaction IDs in that space have moved from the past to the future. That means they become invisible and in effect we have data corruption. That's why we need freezing to prevent that effect from happening. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this, the concept of frozen. Okay, so there is a query you can run that will tell you the age of the oldest tuple in, the, uh, in a table, okay? So, and you can also run a query to find the age of the oldest tuple in the database. Uh, and the, um, the age of the oldest tuple, as it gets closer to, is it approach? Well, let me not get too into the specifics here. Let's go through some of the animation, okay? Um, if age becomes uh, close to 2.14 billion for any table, uh, we are approaching this catastrophic event where transactions that were part that are part of the future now become part of the past. Uh, more specifically, data corruption. Okay, so if your age approaches 2.14 billion, you get this catastrophic event. Okay, now when I freeze the table or freeze the database. In this case, I'm just freezing one table, PG bench history. This knocks this value back down to zero. Now, it only backs it back down to zero if there are no transactions that mean that need specific rows in the table. Okay, but anyhow, it significantly lowers the value. Okay, and then as more update and certain delete transactions take place, that XID age continues to grow. All right, and I should say more XI, uh, delete, update, and insert transactions take place on the PG bench history table. My XID continues to grow again. But anyhow, so I have effectively freezing is taking it and is resetting the oldest tuple in the database. And now I have 2.14 billion transactions to go before I revisit this catastrophe. I revisit the possibility of this catastrophic event on this as a result of the age on this table. Um, okay, so the question is, you want to do, you want to uh, calculate the time until the event horizon. Again, what we're talking about this catastrophic event, and so in order to do that, you want to, you need to be able to uh, monitor your XID consumption. Now, it's not consistent, but you, it is something you do need to monitor. So, here's effectively what you're looking at. You're looking at uh, 2.14 billion. Okay, so that's two to the 31 there. Um, minus the age of the oldest table, or the, the age of the oldest database, as it's approaching zero, how quickly is it approaching zero, and how close is it to zero? Um, so what will happen if you, let's talk about this specific event, and what could happen? Uh, so what you will see is you'll start to see uh, warnings in your database saying you must be vacuumed within uh, this number of our transaction IDs, 
Uh, otherwise, it will shut down, effectively become read-only until a freeze occurs. And I've known cases where it, it hits this value and it could take a long time. You could be down for uh, many hours, in some cases a day or two, a day, if you hit this while the freezing or where the freezing it goes through and freezes the tables. So this does need to be dealt with and it does need to be monitored and it's on part of it's ongoing part of being a Postgres DBA. So the, um, and this will actually uh, stop you, the database will stop you with one million transactions of accepting the commands and it'll effectively shut down and it will not start um, until the vacuum freeze has occurred. And again, this can have a uh, significant business impact. Um, one thing that'll happen is you're not uh, you know, regularly freezing tuples. All of a sudden it'll say, hey, I need to start freezing. It'll kick off a bunch of freezing workers and start uh, try trying to uh, things. And it can result in uh, missing uh, response time SLAs. We have customers who have a 100 millisecond response time. That's their SLA to their customers. If a freezing operation or vacuum operation kicks off, uh, generates a lot of IO, they're at risk of losing, missing their SLAs. And then obviously a forced shutdown, that can be a problem. And I wanna start with, I've talked about a lot of things that can happen. Most database deployments never encounter event. So they never get to a situation where this happens. The way Postgres comes out of the box with auto vacuum tuned, you know, things just keep up and they never hit this. But it's more along a very large databases with a lot of very large tables with a lot of write transactions, update, delete, insert. This is where this is potentially a problem. So you need to know your XID consumption rate. What is it? All right, so I've kind of put some things together here. Uh, so just to kind of put things off. So how much time do I have? Um, so if I do 100 update transactions per second, it's eight months. And we'll read all of these to you. But you can see if I do 400 update transactions per second, it's two months and, and that's if I don't do any freezing in between. But you wanna be counted. So it's really how many XIDs is the application using over a given period of time? That's what you're, uh, that's what you're, you're asking yourself. What is my XID consumption rate? Now, one thing I didn't mention here is we also have the concept of multi-XID, um, multi-XIDs that are used. They're far less frequent or far less encountered, but they have to do with foreign keys and multiple, uh, multiple transactions. So it's a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but uh, this is also something that needs to be dealt with, with for freezing. So not only do you monitor your XID consumption rate, you monitor your multi XID consumption rate. So here's some uh, queries you can use. Okay, so you can, um, you can just effectively select the, uh, the rel name um, and we typically say select as age. Age ID, and it's come, it comes out of one of the PG class table, all right? So effectively, I'm monitor, I'm selecting the age, um, and I'm ordering by the oldest to uh, youngest to oldest. And then I am, uh, I'm just, just selecting it for the PG bench database. Not anything particularly interesting here. Um, so this is it, okay? So my oldest, my oldest tuple is this one, all right? Or my oldest, my database with the oldest tuple is, um, I'm sorry, this is the, uh, these, these three tables have the oldest uh, XID age. Now, what is far more common is you're just interested, is there any tuple in this database that is uh, particularly old, uh, particularly from old uh, tuple ID in it? And that would be, you just use this, uh, select max age from PG database. All right, so that's how you get uh, your current age. Okay, so you're... Yeah, that, but you, that, that number is actually going to be exactly the oldest rel frozen XID from PG class. So basically that runs that query more or less across all your tables. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the ultimate truth right. or the ultimate right. danger point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um so are you, okay. Yeah. So again every uh, every table has um, a rel frozen XID in the PG catalog, PG class table. And effectively here it is. Okay. So I get the age, the rel frozen XID and I get it from PG class. So, okay, now we talk about consumption rate. Okay, so I've gotten this query, I run it several times, and you can see that I am using, in this particular run of PG bench across these two data points. Um, let's see, I guess this is, uh, 
1741, 1756, so roughly um, 15 minutes, a little more than 15 minutes. I use 91,922 XIDs in 904 seconds. Uh, my time till uh, the event is 244 days if no tuples are frozen or the proper number of tuples are not frozen on the proper tables during that day. Okay, but that's based on my current XID consumption rate. Now, obviously your XID consumption rate is not static and your neither is the old the age of the oldest uh, uh, XID in the, in the database. So what you typically are doing is you're monitoring over time, right? So what I've done here is I have on my Y axis, I have the database max age, okay? And then I have time on the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, on the Y axis, I have database max age. On the X axis, I have time. And over time, um, the oldest, um, the oldest uh, tuple in the database uh, rises and falls, okay? So a vacuum freeze, uh, writes, updates, inserts, deletes, cause it to rise. Vacuum freeze events uh, cause it to, to drop. And so we're saying, you know, at this point, everybody logs in, the login time is on the table, it might rise up, okay? And in this case, I've, um, I never reach uh, above, on this particular graph, I never reach above 800,000, um, a long way off from that mark of 2.1 billion. But, you know, this is something to monitor. As I said, many people never ever encounter this or never even know about it or have to learn about it. But um, for those who do, it's important to know and understand. Okay, so this is where things get a little confusing. Freezing does not occur independent of vacuum. Um, you have to do or execute a, a vacuum freeze operation. In vacuum, um, there's, there's a couple of different things to think about. Vacuum, an auto vacuum kickoff in several different ways. You can manually vacuum your table. You can say vacuum and then it'll vacuum your table name or vacuum database. Uh, if you say vacuum freeze or run the command vacuum freeze, it will freeze, uh, it will freeze the tuples that it can. So, but really to understand when vacuuming occurs and how you can run vacuum and under what circumstances it's triggered, you need to understand the concepts of vacuum and auto vacuum. And I've put together a few presentations. Uh, so not only is freezing a little bit of a tricky topic, you need to understand uh, a tricky topic to really understand this particular tricky topic. So a prereq, if you will, for understanding freezing is understanding vacuuming. And I've put together a few, um, a few sources from second quadrant that can help you understand the specifics around when vacuum occurs and when auto vacuum occurs. Um. Uh, there are a number of uh, settings that affect how a uh, vacuum occurs. Now, one of the things you need to understand is that there are basically two flavors of vacuum. There's the flavor of vacuum that is basically concerned with uh, cleaning up uh, uh, bloat, and there's the fl and there's the flavor of vacuum uh, that tries to uh, deal with uh, the necessity for freezing. Uh, the this, this second flavor of vacuum is, is generally known in, uh, in the Postgres world as an aggressive vacuum. It, tries to, it actually tries to access more pages uh, than uh, a non-freezing vacuum, a non-aggressive vacuum. Um, and these are some of the, the settings that uh, affect it. The first one is, is uh, this uh, value, vacuum freeze min age. And this is basically about opportunistic freezing. Uh, this, so uh, this affects whether uh, a whether vacuum that's not aggressive will try to freeze a row that is a candidate for freezing that it just happens to come across. Um, you don't want to set this too low because you might end up doing more work if the tuple is going to be uh, is going to be uh, updated again very soon. Um, the usual um, setting for this is um, something like um, <clears throat> uh, a few hours worth of transactions. So if you measure your transaction rate, uh, like we uh, mentioned in the previous slides, um, and you set this to something that is about average for, say, two or three hours of uh, transactions, that's about the right place to set it. The um, the default is, I think, 50 million, and that's a bit. That can be a bit conservative if you have a high consumption rate for uh, transactions. <coughs> uh, 
Um, the next is uh, vacuum freeze table age. What this uh, affects is <coughs> uh, whether or not uh, we're actually going to do an aggressive vacuum. Now, the fact that, uh, it doesn't actually trigger an auto vacuum. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. What this does is it dis helps decide if we've already decided we're going to do a vacuum, what flavor of vacuum it's going to be. Is it going to be an aggressive vacuum or not? And basically, if the table has uh, crossed this threshold of vacuum freeze table age, then it will be an aggressive vacuum on this table. So we're going to try to, to uh, clean up those uh, uh, live tuples. Um, the last one is the auto vacuum freeze max age. And that basically says that um, uh, if the table crosses that threshold, um, then we're going to, it's one of the things that is actually going to trigger a vacuum. Um, now this is, I think that you actually have to have this set a bit higher than vacuum freeze table age. Um, but, uh, uh, so, and I think the, default for this is 200 million. It's actually quite common to set this quite a bit higher um, to something like um, a billion. We have a slide. Yeah, we have a slide coming up on that. Yeah, but okay. uh, yes, we do. So uh, let, can we move to that slide perhaps? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here we see these actual settings. Um, see vacuum freeze table age set quite low. Um, vacuum free, so, uh, uh, freeze min age is set quite low. Vacuum freeze table age is nearly as high as auto vacuum freeze max age. Now, as I mentioned, it's quite common to to increase that. Uh, and anywhere in this range is quite reasonable. I've seen uh, uh, people who routinely would set it to about a billion. Um, but if you go higher, then you're in danger of uh, not doing enough vacuuming. And say you have a table that gets to be uh, this old without a, a uh, uh, a freezing uh, vacuum running uh, and suddenly you're getting d dangerously close to that um, that event where the database is going to to shut down uh, and require you to take some emergency action um, so normally you don't want to be in this range um, as the slide says you basically need to uh, understand these concepts and you need to discuss them with your developers and, and experts so that everybody is on the same page. Um, it's quite common for people to uh, say, well, it didn't work like that in development and suddenly you find that you're running at much higher transaction rates and things don't work the way that you expect them to. So um, um, these are some of the things that you should be uh, looking at. Um, as I say, for, uh, design first. One of the things that's uh, uh, quite important is to try to reduce your consumption, your transaction consumption rate. Um, uh, if you can do operations in batches, um, uh, then you make life a whole lot easier for yourself. Also, designing tables. Um, to be partitioned. Large tables are your enemy in this in this world and small tables are your friend. Um, and there are also some of these settings which can cause you to do enough vacuuming. Essentially what you want to do is to try to get to a stage where you have a sort of steady state of vacuuming activity. Um, uh, in Postgres 12 we actually reduced uh, the uh, vacuum cost limit so that it's much more realistic um, and that's actually made that auto vacuum out of the box uh, much more uh, effective. So some, as I, some of the design principles as I mentioned avoid having large update intensive tables. Uh, indexes are also uh, uh, can add to the cost of vacuuming. Um, table partitioning is very much your friend. Um, uh, you know, it, freezing and vacuuming takes place one partition at a time. So you're not having to, va instead of having, uh, you know, a terabyte table, you might have to be uh, vacuuming or freezing a table of only, you know, tens of gigabytes or something like that, um, depending on your partitioning setup. Uh, if you have regular maintenance windows, take it, take advantage of them. Um, monitor for long-running transactions. 
Um, this can be as simple as something, you know, symbol, uh, as simple as somebody uh, leaving open um, a PSQL or a PG admin or OmniDB session. Um, and uh, I've seen that uh, more or less bring databases down in the past. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Batching is 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 important as I mentioned. The other thing is that uh, DDL operations on tables will um, uh, cause auto vacuum event uh, auto vacuum to cancel itself because it gets out of the way of the uh, of uh, changes to the table. If you do that often enough, you can lead to starvation of uh, the auto vacuum demon and get yourself into trouble. So be aware. <coughs> of what happens when you do lots of DDL operations. Okay. I think it's you, Tom. It gets back to me. Okay, yeah. so just some best practices for monitoring. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the big one for this presentation is frozen tuple age. You want to transfer your disk, look at your disk I.O. rates and CPU usage. Freezing and vacuuming do use these resources and you want to be sure. Um, and uh, another thing relative to vacuum your time since you last analyzed and long running transactions. And of course, table bloat. So these are just some things we, some best practices we have on monitoring. Uh, okay, so in summary, understand what freezing is, make some design choices, monitor and tune. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you very much. Hopefully we've made up the time and I think we're gonna be around at the end of the stock for some Q and A. Um, okay. Uh, bye. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, want to say your final words here and we'll uh, sign off. Yep. Thank you. And we'll uh, hope, hope you have some good questions. Yeah. And see you at the next Pictures webinar. All right, I'm told the Q&A is live now. Stu, so anybody have any questions they'd like to ask us? Uh, well, we've got the first, I, I see a couple of questions there, Tom. Can you see them? Okay. Um, no. Nope. So, so let's start. Uh, Go ahead. Let's start with the first uh, question, which is, is the transaction limit for a database in the cluster itself or for the cluster as a whole? Uh, the answer is it's for the cluster as a whole. Um, so you have to monitor all the tr all the databases, um, and uh, uh, yeah, in fact, you know you can bring down one database by uh, having some issues in another database. So this has to be monitored across the whole cluster. Um, the second question is, uh, what tools can monitor? Uh, the transaction ID consumption rate. I don't actually know of any tools. Basically, if you uh, if you run a query that uh, selects the uh, the current transaction ID at a certain point in time, and then you wait a certain amount of time and run that query again, um, and then uh, subtract the difference. Um, but I don't know of any any automated tool which actually uh, monitors uh, the transaction ID consumption rate. I can uh, add a little bit to that. Um, I've seen Zabbix do this and do it rather effectively, which is a monitoring tool with the Postgres plugin. But here's a, this is a great question. If somebody tells you they have a monitoring tool for Postgres, ask them if they have a graph for transaction ID consumption rate and then you'll know if it's a really good monitoring tool for Postgres because about half the ones I've seen out there do not actually have that. Um, the third question says, can we have the slides? And I believe we're going to make those available or the video available. Correct. Yep. Yeah. We'll make those available on our website. So it says, the next one says, the transaction limit is 2 million f for a cluster. No, the the transaction space is is in fact about four billion, not million, um, um, but and there is, uh, but the point is that half of that space is going to be in the future. So about f about two billion, that's with a B, uh, 
of your transaction IDs are in the future and about 2 billion are in the past. Um, question number five, I don't quite understand. Um, it says, why this 2 to the 31 limit for transaction ID? The, the, as, I, as we explained, the transaction ID space runs from uh, 0 through to 2 to the 32 minus 1. Um, and the reason that it's that uh, that it's in that space is that it's a, a a four byte quantity, and that's the range of numbers that you can fit into four bytes. If we were to expand that, we would actually need to uh, take more storage for every tuple in the database, um, presumably by expanding it to eight bytes. Um, if you you know, the adding an extra four bytes for every row in the database would be. Um, it, um, might help to get around this problem, but that's a very high price to pay. Um, There's some other things that are being looked at in this area, but um, it's not really a very um, realistic proposition to increase the uh, um, the x min and x max fields on every every row. Um, so is it a good? One? Yeah. yeah, sure. If you want Go to. Ahead, okay. Uh, well, you please comment afterwards. So is it a good to set vacuum cost limits globally or per table? And will scale factor work better uh, Work better or threshold? So um, let's take those are two questions there. So we try to do it globally, right? So you set your uh, your cost limits globally and, um, and just in general set your vacuum limits globally. However, uh, you can go down to doing it in individual tables. But at that time, we found that uh, things become harder to maintain. The people who made that setting leave or there's some, or the, or the design patterns or the table access patterns change. You're not quite sure why they were set that way. So we try to keep them global. And this, uh, the question is, do you set your scale factor? Is it better or your threshold is better? I wouldn't say it's an either or. You want to use the combination of the two. And it's, and that's um, that's generally you want to have your threshold so you're not vacuuming uh, very small tables very regularly. So between scale factor and threshold, you want to use both. So Andrew, anything to add to that or um, subtract? Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's reasonable, Tom. Okay. I mean, one of the things is that it's actually. Uh, hard to uh, describing the uh, the way that uh, per table settings interact with um, um, the global settings particularly with relation to the cost limits is quite difficult and it's it's much you get a much better idea if they're just set on a global basis right. I think I think that's our last question okay then I guess we are uh, we are at conclusion, unless there's any more questions. Um, thank you very much. Please feel free to visit us at secondquadrant.com, and we've enjoyed uh, having this time here together with our host, uh, Enterprise DB, here at Postgres Vision, and hopefully we can do this live next year with another in the picture series with Tom and Andrew, or Andrew and Tom. <laughs> kind of, I want to put it in that order as he comes up with a, he comes with the more technical authority on these things. So thank you, everybody.